Good evening, Mount Calvary and friends. Again, welcome to Wednesday in the Word. As always, we're delighted that you have joined us and we do not take your presence for granted. Uh, this time, we ask that you will bow and let us pray. Oh God, we praise you for who you are and we thank you for your goodness, your kindness, and your mercy. We realize, oh God, that we've sinned and come short of your glory. And we ask, oh God, that you will forgive us yet again and own us as your children. We realize, oh God, that you are the source of our strength and you are the strength of our lives. And for that, God, we say thank you. Now, God, we ask now that you be present with those who need your love and touch. May they feel you, your power of healing and restoration and transformation in their lives. We pray for God. We, we pray, oh God, those who are anxious and overwhelmed and those who are feeling the strain of financial obligations. We ask, oh God, that you would give them peace of mind. We ask, oh God, that you will be their Jehovah Jireh, their provider. We pray, God, for our nation and for our world. Pray for race reconciliation and for race sensitivity. Pray, God, for those who are working on the front line. We ask, oh God, that you will protect them, encourage them, and strengthen them day by day. Now, God, be with us in our study tonight open our hearts and our minds that we may be receptive of your word tonight this we ask in Jesus' name amen uh tonight again we greet you in the wonderful name of our lord and savior jesus who is still the christ and uh we're in a, a series called the attributes of god so far we have looked at two of God's attributes, uh, that God is omniscient and God is omnipresent. That is, God knows everything and God is everywhere present at the same time. Our knowledge is limited, but God is omniscient. You and I, we are limited in space, but God is omnipresent. We are weak but God is all powerful. He is an omnipotent God. And that's what our discourse tonight would be on, the omnipotence of God. Uh, this is one of the attributes that uh, we find that God has. Uh, God is omnipotent. The text that would frame our discussion is found in the book of Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. The book of Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17. Jeremiah 32 and 17 simply says, Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. Nothing is too hard for you. My brothers and my sisters, my sisters and my brothers, every day we experience and depend upon great sources of power. Think of the vast potential of a hydroelectric dam with its generators and how it provides electrical power for large regions of our country. Think of the great power in the, in, in the atom that is harnessed for destruction in the atomic bomb. But as great as these powers are, they are not the greatest power sources in the world. The world itself is empowered by the omnipotence of God who created an entire universe in one awesome display of power. The belief of Christians is our God is good, that our God cares for us, and we believe that God has all power even in the face of sickness, suffering, and death itself, we still believe that God has 
all power. And although this is our belief as Christians, I believe every Christian at one point or another in their walk with Jesus will encounter the suspicion of a non-believer as it relates to the omnipotent power of God. Yet we hear the questions of the doubtful who wonder whether the God we worship is as powerful as we claim he is and as powerful as his word says he is. But your starting point makes the difference. Yeah, if you truly believe that God is all powerful, if you start with your trials and try to reason your way back to God, you would never make it. If you start with lung cancer, it would be hard to find God. If you start with divorce, it would be hard to find God. If you start with rape, it would be hard to find God. If you start with bankruptcy, it would be hard to find God. Although God is present, although you are experiencing and you know about the omnipresence of God, it would be hard to find God when you start with your own difficulties. So what you have to do is start with God and what you know about God and walk forward into the difficulties that you are facing. There is an invisible line that stretches from God to us. That line is the line of God's goodness. It is on that line that we rest our faith. It is on that line that we rest our faith. And, and, and that's why 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. When you start with what you see around you, you will have a hard time finding God in the darkest moments of life. But if you start with God, if you start with God, God's light will illuminate your darkness and you will come to realize afresh and anew that God is an omnipotent God. The omnipotence of God simply means that God is almighty. God has power over the wind, the water, gravity, physics, and everything else. God's power is infinite. God's power is unlimited. God never gets tired. God never gets frustrated. Everything God does, God does with ease. Nothing is never too hard or too difficult for God because God is all-powerful. And because God is all-powerful, there are three things God's omnipotence implies about God. The first one is, God cannot be stopped from accomplishing God's purposes. If God purposes with all his heart to do a thing, it simply cannot be stopped by any power in the universe. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, I am God and there is none like me. My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. Ultimately, the only thing that determines what God will accomplish and what God will not is God's own will. Two, God does what he pleases. Psalms 115 and 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. And three, God's power is superior to all other powers. God's power is superior to all other powers. Isaiah 4 and 28 says, Do you not know, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become wearied or tired. His understanding is unsearchable. Ephesians 3 and 20, Now, 
unto him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. So our challenge tonight is to attempt to understand and experience the thunderous power of the omnipotence of God. Because if you're going to survive in this maze called life, you're going to need some supernatural power in your life. Therefore, I want to look at one, the evidence of God's power, two, the application of God's power in your life, and three, the appropriation of God's power. Yeah, the evidence of God's power, the application of God's power in your life, and the appropriation of God's power. The evidence of God's power. When trying to ascertain the evidence of God's power, the natural place to start is with creation. Creation is a silent witness of God's power. When one say that God is omnipotent, they are proclaiming that he not only has ultimate power over all things, but that he is also the source of all power. Though he sets limits on all of creation, God himself is unlimited in his strength, in his wisdom, in his love, in his holiness, and in his ability to perform his sovereign will. God is the initiator of all that exists. The only uncaused entity in all creation. Though his power is incapable of being understood, we can catch a glimpse of his mighty by considering all that God has made. Colossians 3, 1 and 6 says, He made things. He made all things, every planet, beam of light, law of nature, and human heart. Romans 1 and 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. If at any time there was nothing, then nothing would exist now. But since we have a creation, there must have been a creator. The universe could not have created itself. For to have a self-created universe, the universe would have had to exist prior to creating itself. And if that was the case, then it would not have had to create itself because it would have already existed. But since that's not the case, the universe did not create itself. For just as a painting demands a paint, painter and a design must have a designer, a creation demands a creator. So the creator must have been greater than that which he created. Since the universe is so huge, the one who caused it to come into existence must have, by necessity, be so much greater. As Christians, our belief for this evidence is summed up in what we know as the Apostle Creed which begins with, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Not only does this statement affirm the central biblical Christian truth and claim, namely, that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth, as found in Genesis 1 and 1, but it, 
It also clearly links the affirmation with God's attribute of omnipotence by referring to him as God, the Father Almighty. By linking God's omnipotence with creation in this way, the, the Apostle Creed reaffirms what the Apostle Paul taught in his letter to the Romans that God's eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen in what has been made. So men and women are without excuse. Moreover, the divine nature and eternal power of God is clearly seen in Romans, in, in, in Psalms 19 verses 1 and 2. The heavens are telling the glory of God and they are marvelous display of his craftsmanship. Day and night they keep on telling about God. Every moment of creation is a witness to the fact that God is powerful. The Bible says that the universe was created at God's command. God spoke the world into existence. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, water, and there were oceans, rivers, and lakes. God said, fish, and the ocean, rivers, and lakes were filled with fish. God said, vegetation, and all kinds of vegetation uh, appeared. God said, stars, and the universe was filled with stars. He had the power to speak the world into existence. We see the evidence of God's power every day. That is why it really takes more faith not to believe in God than it does to believe in God. Look at Jesus. Jesus' life displayed the power of God. He had power over nature. He calmed the storm. He told the waves to sit down and shut up, and they became quiet. He spoke to a tree, and it withered. Another time, he turned water into wine. He had power over illness and disease. He healed the blind, the sick, the lame, and the disease. He raised people from the dead. He had power over the devil. One time, uh, he told a bunch of demons to come out of the man, and, and, and they went into a, a bunch of pigs, and, 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 and that became known as... As the original devil ham. Somebody get that in the morning. God's power is awesome. And the evidence is in creation. The application of God's power in your life is simply this. Believe it or not, God wants to share his power with you. Ephesians 1 and 20, I pray that you will begin to understand how incredible great power, uh, how incredible great his power is to help those who believe. The same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. There are so many people who are powerless. They feel like victims. Victims of society, victims of circumstances, victims by other people, victims by their health. They always feel a dollar short and a day late. They take two steps forward only to find themselves having to take one step backward. They never seem to be able to get ahead. They never seem to be able to get it together. They feel powerless. But God says he wants to give you some power in your life. God wants to give you power to get started. Most of us have a problem with this from time to time. For how many good things have you been postponing? Saying you're going to get around to, to it someday. Or maybe there's something that you would like to change about yourself, but you, you can't seem to get motivated to start. Or maybe you find yourself being paralyzed by procrastination. Romans 7, 18 says, I often find that 
I have the will to do good, but not the power. You want to do what is right. You want to do what is good, but you just don't have the power. Yeah, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And how many of you have learned that good intentions are not enough? The Bible goes on to say that no matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. Sometimes you get in a cycle of bad habits, and it's hard to break out of those bad habits, and you don't know how to get started. The Bible declares how to perform that which is good, I find not. This is a common symptom of people. Many times in life you will face tasks which you are ill-prepared. You don't have the ability, the talent, the energy, the intelligence, the background, the money, nor the power. What do you do about those kinds of things where your performance does not match up to what needs to be done? That is where the good news comes in. The good news is that God can give you the power to perform. He can give you the power to get started. When you are helpless, God will help you get started in making the changes that he wants you to make. Philippians 2 and 13, for God is at work within you, giving you the will and the power to achieve his purpose. God says he wants to give you power to keep on going and because he wants to give you the power to keep on going, you have to get started. So God not only wants to give you power to get you started, but God wants to give you power to keep you going. It is one thing to get started. And many people are great, great starters, but it's another thing to keep on going. To keep on doing what you know is right even when you don't feel like it. God says he will not only give you power to get started, but he will give you power to keep on going. And many of you can relate to this verse in Psalm 6, 2 and 3. I am worn out, O Lord. Give me strength. I am completely exhausted. And my whole being is deeply troubled. For some of you, this is a light verse. You are so tired. Everything wears you out. So what do you do when you're tired? God says he wants to help you to keep on going. He wants to help you to keep on going. Nothing else can help you to keep going like he can. Ask Solomon about it. Solomon in Ecclesiastes 2 and 11 says, I looked at everything I had, I, I had tried, and it was all so useless. A chasing of the wind, and there was really nothing worthwhile anywhere. And, I, and, 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 and you thought midlife crisis was a 21st century development. Solomon had a great one right here, and you may feel this way. Maybe... You may feel this way about your career. You have, you have tried all kinds of things, but it's just not working. And you know that you should keep on going, but you don't feel like it. You, you feel like giving up. The Bible says that God can give you the power to keep on going. God can give you the power not only to perform, but God can give you the power to persist. And that's good news. Good news. God will give you the ability to persist. When you reach the end of your rope, God's power will give you a second wind that will enable you to keep on going. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31, the Lord is the everlasting God. He never grows tired or weary. His 
He strengthened those who are weak and tired. Those who trust the Lord for help will find their strength rewarded. God will give you power to persist because God's power is unlimited. He never gets tired. He never gets weary. He never goes to bed. He never gets tired of your prayer requests. He never gets tired of you talking to him. God never gets tired of anything. And that ought to be uh, a word of personal encouragement to you. When you are drained and at the end of your rope, you know that you can tap into a power that is unlimited. God has unlimited energy. He can he created the universe. And then he said, what's next? Created a universe and didn't get tired. Although the Bible said that God, after creation, uh, uh, that he rested on the seventh day. Rest, what God did, is not the same rest that we do today. We rest because we are tired. But when God said he rested on the seventh day, it doesn't mean that he was tired. But when God rested on the seventh day, it simply meant that he was finished. There wasn't anything else to do. God was finished. So rest for God didn't mean restoration. But rest for God simply meant ceasing from creative activity because God had completed the whole world in six days. Isaiah 40, 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount it with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God wants to give you the power to persist. For he has promised to energize those who trust him. And I know some of you are thinking that may work for you, but that doesn't work for me. I'm a believer, but I never felt God's power in my life. I don't know if this stuff really works. The fact is, God's power is not automatic. There are some steps that you must follow. You have to appropriate God's power in your life life. And this brings us to the third part of this study tonight. The ways to appropriate God's power in your life. Let me give you four quick ways and I'll be finished. One, admit your lack of power. Admit your lack of power. Admit that you don't have it all together. Our problem is that we think that we are God. We think that we can handle everything. We, we think that we have omnipotent power. We think that we can do everything. If you don't believe it, all you need to do is just look at your schedule. If you burn a candle on both ends, you are not as bright as you think you are. Admit your need for God's power in your life. When you think that you can do it all on your own, stress, tension, and frustration will come as a result of. Midlife crisis is simply waking up to your own limitation and realizing that you are not God. You cannot control everything. You are not going to reach every goal you set in life. You are not going to make as much money that you, as you thought you were going to make. You're getting older. You are human. You have weaknesses. So what do you do when you realize you're weak? 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, Paul says, God said to me, where there is a weakness, my power is shown more completely. Therefore, I have cheerfully made up my mind to be proud of my weaknesses because they mean a deeper experience of Christ's power. For my very weakness makes me strong 
in him. When you pretend to be self-sufficient, you short-circuit God's power in your life. Yeah, when you pretend to be self-sufficient, you short-circuit God's power in your life. A self-made man, a self-made woman needs to admit his or her uh, inadequacy. And then he or she can start having power. Until then, he or she is going to suffer from burnout. So you got to admit, admit your lack of power. To believe in faith, the key to personal power in your life is to believe in faith. Nothing else works. You've got to believe in faith. Believe in faith. Mark 9, 23, everything is possible for him who believes. Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, it will be done. Believe in faith. If that is true, and it is, let me ask you two vital questions. What are you expecting God to do in your life? What are you expecting God to do in your life? And what are you expecting God to do through your life? What are you expecting God to do through your life? God works according to faith. Since God has unlimited power, you should not limit him because of your expectations of him. You only limit God by your own belief. Brothers and sisters, God has given you an atomic bomb power. But you want to live a firecracker life. There is no problem too big for God. And there is no request that God cannot handle. So the issue really becomes your faith. What are you willing to believe God for? If you want to see God's power in your life, you must first believe in faith. You got to believe it. You got to believe it. Third, speak in faith. Not only must you admit your lack of power, not only must you believe in faith, but three, you got to speak in faith. This is very important. You. This is very important for you to speak in faith. 2 Corinthians 4 and 13, with that same spirit of faith, we also speak because we believe. You must verbalize your faith. You must announce what you are counting on God to do. You must not just think it in your mind, but you must announce it. You got to verbalize it. You got to speak it in faith. Speaking, speaking in faith is akin to setting a goal. A goal is really a statement of faith. When you set a goal, you believe that you will achieve it by a certain time. So goals are simply statements of faith. The size of your goal is determined by the size of your God. Show me what your goals are in life, and I'll tell you what you are believing about God. It is very important that you announce your goal up front. Say it in faith. The Bible says in the book of James that your tongue is the rudder of your life. It, it, it is like the little rudder that, that moves the giant ship. The way you talk to yourself and to others directs the course of your life. The Bible says in Proverbs, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So what are you saying about your marriage, about your job, about your health, about your finances, about your children? Many of you are waiting for God to do something and believe in him for a miracle, but you are short-circuiting uh, the miracle uh, by the way you talk. Yeah, you believe in one place, but you deny and negate it by your complaints. 
what are you saying? Yeah, I believe God is going to save my marriage, but my marriage is the pits. I'm praying for my kids that they will really take a stand for the Lord, but, but they are hopeless. I'm really praying that God heal me, but I know I'm never going to get well. I want God to change my life and help me to break those bad habits, but this is just the way I am. I'm not, I'm not ever going to change. You are short-circuiting God's power in your life by your mouth. Do what Romans 4 and 17 says. Call those things that are not as if they were. You, you got to speak it in faith. The fourth and final thing is simply this. After you admit your lack of power, you got to believe in faith. You got to speak in faith. And then fourth, you got to act in faith. This is very vital. And most folk miss this point. Act in faith. You must step out in advance before the power is release. God wants you to take every action before you see anything. The disciples were in a boat one night and they saw this figure walking on the water. Some of the disciples thought it was a ghost. But Peter looked and said, no, that's the Lord. And Peter simply said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. You had the other disciples, 11, who stayed in the boat. But Peter took a risk acted in faith knowing that he or no other human had ever walked on water before but because Jesus said come unto me he stepped out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus you've got to act in faith you've got to act as if you have already got it even though that you don't have it, you're acting as though you already have it. And when you do, you're acting in faith. You, you, you act as if. You act as if God is going to provide. That's, uh, you believe it. You may not have nothing in the covers, may not be anything in the refrigerator, but you set the table. You act in faith. You believe that God is going to give you your daily bread. And when you step out in advance, before you even see it, God blesses your faith. And that's why you have to act in faith. So many people miss God's blessing on their life because they want to see it before they act. If you see it, it wouldn't be faith. But you want to see it before you do it. But God wants you to act in faith. A few days ago, I was reading how Joshua and the children of Israel came up to the Jordan River. It was very similar to the Moses event at the Red Sea. The whole nation had to pass over the river in order to get to the promised land. But the thing about it, with Joshua and the Joshua generation, it was springtime. And the banks of the Jordan were overflowing. It was impossible for them to cross at that level. But God said to Joshua, 
take the leaders and put them out front of the people and tell them to walk into the river. And after they began to walk into the river, I would dam it up a little ways up north and the water would recede and you would be able to walk across on dry land. The leaders, along with Joshua, acted in faith. And they began to walk into the river. And, and the water was up to their ankle, their knees, then their thighs. They were probably thinking, we're not going to be able to walk much farther. But look at what happened. The Bible says in Joshua 3, when the priests put their feet in the water, the Jordan River Stop flowing. They acted as if the water would stop, and it did. And when it did, God released his power when they acted. God wants to share his power with you, but you got to act in faith. Some of you are waiting for God to do a miracle in your life, but in reality, God is waiting on you. God is waiting on you to take the first step. And the power will not be released unto you until you take that first step. And when you act as if you have the power to do, God will supply the power you need to do it. So act in faith. In closing, what good it is for you to know that God is an omnipotent God, that God has all power, and you never take advantage of the, the power that he has that he's willing to share with you. God's power is available to you. So whatever you are expecting God to do in your life next week, or even this week, don't limit God by your unbelief. For God is an omnipotent God. He has all power. He's an all-powerful God. And he wants to share his power with you. Three things God's omnipotence implies. He cannot be stopped from accomplishing his purposes. He does whatever he pleases. His power is superior to all other power. The evidence of God's creation or God's power is found in creation. The application of God's power in your life is that he gives you the power to get started, to perform. He gives you the power to keep going, to persist. And the appropriation of God's power in your life, admit your lack of power. Believe in faith. Speak in faith. Act in faith. God bless you. Tonight is the word of God has been a blessing to you. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior simply because that you admit, admitted that you are a sinner. You confess your sins. You believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. You believe that he died for your sins rose on the third day and that he sits in heaven at the right hand side of the Father making intercession on your behalf and you confess him as Lord and Savior of your life and you and you're connected and you get connected up with the church oh what a day of rejoicing it would be when we all get to heaven and that's what it's really all about eternal life is about making heaven your home when you shall meet death face to face. And heaven is, is better.
than here. But we have to start here, making preparation to go there. There is no coronavirus in heaven. There aren't any bills to pay in heaven. It's a whole different state of affairs than what we encounter here on earth. But we make preparation to get there from here. So if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior Jesus, tonight is a good night. Tonight is a good night to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you shall be saved and get connected up with the church. Shall we pray? God, our Father, we thank you so much and we know that you have all power. We thank you for speaking to us through your word and reminding us that you are the omnipotent God. We pray, oh God, that this study will continue to impact us our lives in days and weeks yet to come. Oh God, you have shown us what we need to do. Help us to continue to walk in your word because it is your will for our lives. God, we, we need your power like we have never needed your power before. So God, we ask in the name of Jesus, that you would give us the power to perform, the power to persist. We, we, we need your power. We believe in faith. We speak in faith. And we shall act in faith. Now God, we ask that you bless us until we meet again for another Wednesday in the Word. Bless us and bind us with cords of love that can never be broken. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us for Wednesday in the Word. We do invite you to join us on next Wednesday as we continue to study God's Word. Have a blessed week, and we look forward to seeing you real soon.